as we delve deeper and deeper into Matthew's Gospel, to this point we have found three elements to be always present and, and repetitive. Therefore, it's crucial for us to notice them and to understand that Matthew has constructed his Gospel around them. First, Matthew presents Yeshua of Nazareth as the second Moses, and thus paints him in that role as the prophet like me that Moses prophesied would come. Second of all, the Kingdom of Heaven has arrived. It arrived when John the Baptist appeared as a type of Elijah, or perhaps better having the spirit of Elijah, announcing that a path was being made in the wilderness for the coming of the Lord. Thus everything that happens, every utterance of Christ is to be taken in that knowledge and in that context, because it marks the beginning of a new era that ushers us into the final era. And third, Matthew highlights the ongoing relevance and efficacy of the Law of Moses for Jesus' followers, only now it is to be accomplished in light of believers having the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and of Messiah's demand given in the Sermon on the Mount, that these laws and commandments from His Father are to be taken to an even higher level in our lives, with not only the outward, but also the inward moral perfection as the goal. Not only our behavior is to be conformed to the will of God, but also our intents and our motives. Now, many Bible scholars and commentators, as well as numerous of those esteemed men who established the original faith doctrines of the thousands of Christian denominations, would generally agree with my observations as concerns the first two of these three elements we find thus far constantly present within the book of Matthew. Few would agree with the third element, even though a plain, logical, even historical reading of Matthew's narrative reveals it with a great degree of clarity. I have long found it fascinating and honestly not just a little bit puzzling why it is this way. What or who this source of this anti Law of Moses viewpoint was, where did it come from? I mean, I also know from the many emails sent to me that not just a few of you might like to know how this happened. What the earliest church thought about this matter, and if this anti law stance of the modern church has always been with us. So before we continue in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to take a substantial detour to look into this rather important matter that has, to my way of thinking, sent the church hurtling towards that very darkness that Christ was warning us against. And the way to do this is to study the writings of the early church fathers. Now this is going to be a bit lengthy, because I'm going to present to you some of the writings of the early church fathers. Now because context matters, I'm not going to quote only a phrase or just a sentence, but rather a paragraph or more. So to be patient, please, but also please stay focused. This is information that every believer needs. There is a long list of what are commonly called the early church fathers. And, and these are bishops and teachers and scholars that include the very earliest 
first century church leaders, apart from the original apostles, all the way up to the 8th century church leaders. The main dividing points among them are whether each served in the East or in the West, and whether each lived and wrote before or after the Council of Nicaea. It was at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, convened at the behest of the Roman Emperor Constantine, when the Christian Church began to morph into something more recognizable to us today as the institution that it's become. At Nicaea, later on at Laodicea, the many independent churches underwent a consolidation of authority to be based in Rome, with a centralized church government under a common set of faith doctrines and principles, although some of the attending bishops rejected those doctrines and so many of those churches grew on their own outside of the authority of Rome. Now, the vast majority of these faith doctrines have shaped and tooled especially the Western Church from that day forward for the better or the worse. Now, the earliest of the early Church Fathers is Clement of Rome. Clement was born about 30 AD, just about the time of Christ's crucifixion. So he was alive during the lifetimes of the original twelve disciples. Not a great deal is known about his early history exactly when he became a believer. What is known is that in the later part of his life he became a member of the church government of the Church of Rome. Thus he had power and he had authority. Now what makes him so important for what I want to show you is that he represents the absolute earliest of the Church Fathers that operated at a time when Jews still represented the bulk of church leadership. Now, it's believed that Clement was, was a Gentile, probably a Roman. He was personally discipled by Peter and Paul. We find him mentioned most prominently in the book of Philippians, when he was working alongside Paul at the city of Philippi about 57 AD, here in Philippians 4.3. I also request you, loyal uh, Syzygus, to help these women, for they have worked hard proclaiming the good news with me along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, near to or shortly after Paul's death, Clement wrote epistles to various of the churches that Paul had established, because Clement was a natural successor to the martyred Paul, having been at his side, learning his doctrine from him. This is a good time to mention that many epistles were written by various early church leaders, and they were floating around the many believing synagogues, which is what the earliest churches were, as were several gospel accounts of Christ's life. It would not be until early in the third century that a church council convened, and they chose from among quite a number of these authoritative documents the few that would be declared holy with the purpose of establishing the first Christian Bible. That's the thing we call the New Testament. So Clement's letters carried much weight, as did Paul's and Peter's and John's. Now unfortunately, just a few of Clement's works have survived. We only know of the existence of the others because they are given mention by later Church Fathers, such as Polycarp and Papias and Eusebius. However, we do have what has become labeled the First Epistle to the Corinthians, 
penned by Clement that reveals some, some pretty important information about his faith principles and his foundational beliefs. And since there is no known rebuttal of his point of view from this era, nor does he disagree with any of the New Testament writings that would come later, it's, it's, it's reasonable to conclude that his can be taken as the earliest doctrinal viewpoint, not only of Gentile members of the Church of Jesus Christ, but also of its leadership, Jew and Gentile. His epistle is wonderful reading, but for the sake of time and for our purposes, I'm going to only give you a couple of excerpts that are especially eye-opening and characteristic, I think, of his entire epistle, while at the same time pointing out that the reason for his letter to the Corinthian church that Paul had established was that the church there was in turmoil, and they were fighting among themselves. The wolves in sheep's clothing that Yeshua warned His followers would come. The false prophets that would arise within the church, they were the problem. But the problem behind the problem was disobedience to the Law of Moses, although perhaps not in ways we might instinctively have suspected. Here is Clement of Rome. These things, therefore, being manifest to us, and since we look into the depths of the divine knowledge, it behooves us to do all things in their proper order, which the Lord has commanded us to perform at stated times. He has enjoined offerings to be presented and service to be performed to Him, and that not thoughtlessly or irregularly, but at the appointed times and hours. Where and by whom He desires these things to be done, He Himself has fixed by His own supreme will, in order that, we, that all things being piously done according to His good pleasure may be acceptable unto Him. Now, those therefore who present their offerings at the appointed times are accepted and blessed. For inasmuch as they follow the laws of the Lord, they sin not. For His own peculiar services are assigned to the high priest, and their own proper place is prescribed to the priests and their own special ministrations devolve on the Levites, and then the layman is bound by the laws that pretend to layman. Now put on your Jewish mindset for the moment. To understand what the Gentile believer and church leader Clement is saying, okay, he says that the believers of Corinth, church started by Paul, are duty-bound to do all things in their proper order. By order, he means, from a Christ follower's perspective, the things, the ritual things, that are to be done, when they are to be done, and who is to do them. The things that the believers at Corinth are to do and therefore this pertains to any and every group of Christians, by the way, are the rituals that the Lord has commanded to be observed at their stated times, or better, at their appointed times. Therefore, Clement goes on to say that the required offerings, sacrifices, and the way they're to be presented are fixed by God. Therefore, we, they are to be done in a, a, a pious manner, so that such observances cannot change, and thereby that will be pleasing to God. This means that when one presents their offerings, they should occur at the appointed times, biblical feasts for an example, so that they will be accepted and blessed by God, and further, 
that doing the things that are the laws of the Lord mean they're avoiding sin. That is, to not do these laws and commandments as they are prescribed is sin. And clearly, this can only be referring to the law of Moses. Now, while so many in the church will twist his term, the laws of the Lord, into meaning the laws of Jesus, which is simply not so, we find Clement making it clear that it can only be the law of Moses, the biblical Torah he's speaking about, because he then devolves into saying that priests must do what the Lord commanded, as well as the Levites, and then laymen as well. And there is no record of Yeshua issuing instructions to priests and to Levites. Priests and Levites each have their own roles, and they cannot be assigned to the common class of God worshipers, laymen. However, laymen, well, laymen also have their own set of responsibilities. In Clement's language, their own order. Let's read a little bit further in his first epistle to the Corinthians. Let every one of you brethren give thanks to God in His own order, living in all good conscience, with becoming gravity, not going beyond the rule of the ministry prescribed to Him. Not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices to be offered, or the peace offerings, or the sin offerings, and the trespass offerings, but in Jerusalem only. And even there they can't be offered in any place, but only at the altar before the temple. That which is offered being first carefully examined by the high priest and the ministers already mentioned. Those therefore who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to His will are punished with death. You see, brethren, that the greater the knowledge that we have been vouchsafed to us, the greater also is the danger to which we are exposed. See, the first thing we can conclude from his words are that since he speaks plainly <laughs> about the temple and the altar and the sacrifices thereupon, he wrote this epistle prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But also notice that clearly Clement was addressing a controversy. See, it seems that some in the church at Corinth were offering the daily tamid, that everyday sacrifice prescribed in the Law of Moses, as well as offering some of the other classes of sacrifices like peace offerings and sin offerings and trespass offerings, but they were doing it locally. They were doing it in Corinth. Now, this could only be happening at an altar that the Cor uh, Corinthian believers built, probably associated with their synagogue, their church if you would, at Corinth. But that was not their right. It was not their order. It was not their position to do. These sacrificial rituals were to be done only by the priests and the Levites and only at the temple in Jerusalem. So what we find is that Clement, the earliest Gentile church father, Paul's and Peter's understudy, understands that the law of Moses, including the ongoing temple sacrifices, pertain to believers. But believers cannot change the law in the name of Christ such that laymen can now perform sacrifices, or that these sacrifices can now be performed at Corinth or any other place they might choose. Rather, these must only be done by priests at the temple altar in Jerusalem as prescribed by the law. There can be no stronger or more straightforward endorsement than Clements of the continuing relevance and authority of the Law of Moses 
as it stood for centuries for all believers. Now, those of us, the minority in the church, who believe in Yeshua as Savior, and that only His blood and divine grace can save us. At the same time, also know that Yeshua's own words, that we are duty-bound to continue following the law of Moses, not as a means of, gain, of gaining our salvation, but rather as evidence of it. See, this is something that is exactly in line with what Clement was taught by Paul and Peter, and so he himself just continued the doctrine. We don't have to speculate about this. It's recorded for us. I just read it to you. Now, another very early church father, Papias, was born when Clement was about 40 years old, and he seems to have personally known Clement. Although there are but fragments of his works available to us, we learn this important fact from Papias. Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best he could. So what we are reading in our New Testament from the Jewish Matthew was first written down in Matthew's and Christ's birth language, Hebrew. And this fact lends further weight to Clement's position concerning what he was taught from the Jews, Peter and Paul. And when we maintain that Jewish context, both cultural and religious, that the New Testament was written in, and Matthew's is the most Jewish of the Gospels in my opinion, clearly the earliest Christians knew they were to continue to be obeying the Law of Moses. However, some believers outside of the Holy Land, Corinth for an example, went so far, too far, by trying to themselves perform the priestly duties of the Law, and doing them wherever they just happened to be, like in Corinth. So, from around 50 A.D. to around 90 or 100 A.D., the generally held belief within the church was that the Law of Moses was still relevant, valid, and to be obeyed by both Jewish and Gentile believers. <laughs> However, the how of it was being hotly debated within the church, whose congregations were dispersed in foreign nations outside of the Holy Land. And as we read the works of succeeding church fathers, we see a decided turn. Hear this. We see a decided turn from how to do the law as believers to these leaders being against the law and then even against the Jewish people. We find this reality boldly expressed and the writings of the early church father, Justin Martyr. Now he was born in 110 AD, died at only 55 years of age, but he wrote profusely, and his works are greatly revered and taught within Christian seminaries, at least partly because so many of his documents are complete and they're well preserved. They are also <laughs> well-pleasing to a Gentiles-only church. I'm going to read to you some excerpts that he wrote, which come from one of the most famous documents in all Christendom, a dialogue with Trypho. Now, by all accounts, this is a true encounter that the Gentile Christian Justin Martyr had with the Jew Trypho and during part of the conversation some of Trypho's Jewish friends were present. So in a dialogue with Trypho, we read about this back and forth conversation between Justin and, and Trypho, the Gentile and the Jew. 
And I want to read a few excerpts from it so that you can see what Christianity had already become by about 150 A.D., only perhaps 60 or 70 years after the Church Father Clement lived and governed and wrote. Justin Martyr says, he's talking to Trifo and his friends that are there, Is there any other matter, my friends, in which we are blamed than this, that we live not after the law, and are not circumcised in the flesh as your forefathers were, and we do not observe Sabbaths as you do. Are our lives and customs also slandered among you? I ask, have you also believed concerning us that we eat men, and that after the feast, having extinguished the lights, we engage in promiscuous concubinage? Or do you condemn us in this alone? that we adhere to such tenets and believe in an opinion untrue as you think. Well, this is what we are amazed at, said Trifo. But those things about which the multitude speak, they are not worthy of belief, for they are most repugnant to human nature. Moreover, I am aware that your precepts and the so-called gospel are so wonderful and so great, I suspect no one can keep them for I have carefully read them. But this is what we are at most loss about, that you, professing to be pious and supposing yourselves better than others, are not in any particular way separated from them. And do you not, and you don't alter your mode of living from that of the nations, in that you observe no festivals, no Sabbaths, do not have the rite of circumcision, and further, resting your hopes on a man that was crucified, you yet expect to obtain some good thing from God while you do not obey His commandments. Have you not read that that soul shall be cut off from His people who have not been circumcised on the eighth day, and this has been ordained for strangers and for slaves equally? But you, despising this covenant rashly, reject the consequent duties, and you attempt to persuade yourselves that you know God. When, however, you perform none of these things which they do who fear God. If, therefore, you can defend yourself on these points and make it manifest in what way you hope for anything whatsoever, even though you do not observe the law, this we would very glad to hear from you, and we shall make other similar investigations. So, this is interesting. Interesting stuff. So Justin Martyr says that there are all kinds of slanderous accusations by Jews about what Christians do, even including cannibalism and having wild festive orgies. I want to pause to point out that by this time, Gentiles fully controlled the church. Jewish believers had been marginalized, mostly pushed out. So, what Jews said about Christians was essentially a retort and a response to what a Gentile exclusionary Christianity now falsely claimed against Jews. It was a tit for tat. Now Trifo responds to Justin that he is intelligent and observant enough to know that some of the more outrageous things said about Christians are not true. However, he does believe that some other things said are true and those things completely puzzling. He says that he has carefully read the gospel. Which of the several in circulation at that time, we don't know. My bet is it was Matthew because his was first written in Hebrew and was written to Jews in a Jewish context. And these things that puzzle him are, how can you read that gospel and say you believe what's written and then turn around and refuse to obey the law of Moses as a basic doctrine? How can you do that? 
How can you defend dropping the feasts, the Sabbath, refuse circumcision when the subject of the gospel, Jesus himself obeyed these laws and has said his followers should too? Trifo, it seems to me, received some of the truths of the gospel better than Justin Martyr did. It's only that Trifo rejected it on the principle that Yeshua of Nazareth was not the Messiah or the Son of God. Here is Justin's response now to that accusation. There will be no other God, O Trifo, nor was there from eternity any other existing. I thus addressed him. But he who made and disposed all this universe. Nor do we think that there is one God for us, another for you, but that He alone is God who led your fathers out from Egypt with a strong hand and a high arm. Nor have we trusted in any other, for there is no other, but in Him in whom you have also trusted, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. But we don't trust through Moses or through the law, for then we'd be the same as yourselves. Justin then goes on to attack a few of God's laws and commandments of the Torah. So this is Justin continuing. And God Himself proclaimed by Moses, speaking thus, And circumcise the hardness of your hearts, and no longer stiffen the neck. For the Lord your God is both Lord of lords, and a great, mighty, and terrible God, who regardeth not persons, and taketh not rewards and in Leviticus, because they have transgressed against me and despised me, and because they have walked contrary to me, I also walked contrary to them, and I shall cut them off in the land of their enemies. Then shall their uncircumcised heart be turned. For the circumcision according to the flesh, which is from Abraham, was given as a sign, that you may be separated from other nations and from us, and that you alone may suffer that which you now justly suffer and that your land may be desolate, and your cities burned with fire, and the strangers may eat your fruit in your presence, and not one of you may go up to Jerusalem. For you are not recognized among the rest of men by any other mark than your fleshly circumcision. For none of you, I suppose, will venture to say that God uh, neither did nor does foresee the events which are future, nor foreordained His deserts for each one, Accordingly, these things have happened to you in fairness and in justice, for you slayed the just one and his prophets before him. And now you reject those who hope in him and in him who sent him, God the Almighty and Maker of all things, cursing in your synagogues those that believe on Christ. For you have not the power to lay hands upon us on account of those who now have the mastery. So Justin, who was now sarcastic, and he's talking down to Trifo, says that circumcision of the flesh is only for Jews, and Jews are circumcised only because they're rebellious and evil before God. That's his viewpoint. That is, circumcision has always been more a punishment and a curse than a blessing. And further, the Jews have no place and leading Christians. That's what it means by laying hands upon us. Because Gentile Christians are now in control. They have the mastery. A little more of Justin. Moreover, that God enjoined you to keep the Sabbath and imposed on you other precepts for a sign, as I have already said, that's on account of your unrighteousness and that of your fathers. Moreover, you were commanded to abstain from certain kinds of food in order that you might keep God before you are, before your eyes while you ate and drank, seeing that you were prone and very ready to just depart from His knowledge. So what we see is that by about 150 A.D. it had become doctrine that Christians not only should not obey the law, they saw God's commandments as inherently bad. And essentially, God created them for what? to be a curse set upon a people, the Hebrews, and given to them 
due to their unrighteousness. It gets worse. It gets worse from here forward. As the early church fathers that followed Justin Martyr became more and more entrenched in anti-Jewish, anti-law rhetoric and doctrine until we come to the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which began a, a series of ecumenical council meetings that wrote and then forever changed, forever embedded itself within Christianity, those same anti-Jewish, anti-law views of Justin Martyr. That would have startled and dismayed the earliest church father, Clement of Rome. Now sadly, Justin Martyr is held up by the institutional church as exemplary. It's his views that had to be taken dearly and more or less followed as doctrine. Therefore, it's not hard to trace what happened within Christianity that it became an anti law of Moses and anti Jewish religion as it corresponds directly to the deaths of Peter, Paul, and John and the end of authority in the church of Jewish apostles and Gentiles like Clement of Rome, and then the takeover of Gentiles who very quickly abandoned and then outlawed anything within Christianity that even resembled something that the Jews did. By definition, this had to include no further obedience to the Law of Moses, the end of observing God-appointed times like Sabbath, the Biblical feasts, and the ordinance of male circumcision, and so much more. Now, I believe I've said enough to get my point across. It was not my intention to teach a course on the early church fathers today, but rather just to show you the path that was taken so early in the development of Christianity to disavow the Law of Moses. So we're going to stop here now. And we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 8. Now, we ended last time at verse 13 of Matthew chapter 8. The story of the Roman centurion in Capernaum asking Yeshua to heal his ill house slave. Now, while it's erroneously taught that this is about a Gentile coming to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that is not at all evident in the story. There's nothing said about a conversion. It's only that the centurion knew of, or was eyewitness to, probably, Yeshua's miraculous healing powers. So he asked him if he would do the same for his house slave. Now, obviously, the servant was, was dear to that Roman centurion's heart. Now, Yeshua was not astonished because his Gentile soldier had a religious faith in Yeshua or perhaps was a secret convert, such was not the case. Rather, he saw this, this unyielding trust in Yeshua's ability to heal as a very good illustration for the Jews to pattern themselves after as an unyielding type and depth of faith that they ought to have in God. But because so many Jews in general, he calls them those born for the kingdom, have nothing like this kind of faith, then Christ says the consequence is they will not be admitted into the kingdom of heaven, but rather will be thrown into the darkness outside of it. Bottom line, a deep, unequivocal trust in God is needed to be a part of His kingdom. A trust that is reflected in their lives and in their actions. Simply being born of a Hebrew heritage does not give any Jew a free ticket into the kingdom of heaven. Only those Jews who heed the warning shall enter the kingdom. Let's read just a little bit more. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to be on page 1232. 
1232. I'm going to read just verses 14 to 17. Yeshua went to Kepha's home, that's Peter's home, and there saw Kepha's mother-in-law sick in bed with a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began helping him. And when evening came, many people held in the power of demons were brought to him. And he expelled the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were ill. This was done to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Yeshiel, Isaiah. He himself took our weaknesses and bore our diseases. Now the Gospel of Mark also reports on this story of uh, Yeshua going to Peter's house to tend to Peter's ill mother-in-law. Before we discuss it, let's just read Mark's version. It's just a couple of verses. In Mark 1, 29-31, Mark reports it this way. They left the synagogue and went with Yaakov, that's, that's uh, uh, James, and Yochanan, John, to the home of Shimon, that's Simon Peter, and Andrew. Now, Shimon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and they told Yeshua about her. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her onto her feet, and that fever left her, and she began helping them. Okay. So we learn from Mark that Yeshua had been in a synagogue in Capernaum, along with his brother James and his disciple John, the eventual writer of Revelation. Now this has to have occurred after Yeshua had returned to Capernaum from speaking His Sermon on the Mount. Now although it's hard to tell when, because Mark never even mentions the Sermon on the Mount, the three men went to Peter's, Shimon's house, apparently the disciple Andrew was also living there at the time, where Christ would perform yet another miracle healing. Now one takeaway from these couple of verses is, Peter indeed was a married man. Although his wife and the existence of children is never explicitly mentioned. Now, Yeshua touched Peter's mother in law by taking her hand, and she was healed specifically of her fever. Then, because the healing was immediate, she got up out of her sickbed and began to serve Yeshua. Now, in the Jewish culture of that day, as it pertains to women, to serve him didn't mean to hold a religious meeting. Rather, it merely meant to prepare and serve Jesus a meal. The lack of detailed information and Jesus' knowledge of this woman's illness implies a closer relationship with her than with others that He healed. That is, she seems to have been known and familiar to Him. Now I think another but much shorter detour is in order. The truth of this story is further validated by the discovery of Peter's house in Capernaum, a rather well-preserved archaeological site. Peter's house is only a hundred feet or so from the ruins of a large synagogue. However, those ruins are of a later synagogue built in 300 AD, which very likely Matter of fact, it's pretty well been proven, lies upon the ruins of the earlier one. That's just the way things were done during biblical times. Now, I've had the pleasure of taking many of you there on, on tours to Israel. Now, at present, a Catholic church is built over the site. Okay, that is to say, it is a building built on pillars above the ruins of Peter's house to both house to both commemorate it but also to preserve it. Now Peter's house was was pretty typical of that era, small, simple, unadorned. However, archaeologists discovered that perhaps late in the 1st century, perhaps early in the 2nd, the there were additions made to it, including an octagonal structure. You see it here in the picture this octagonal structure that was built around the original, with the original walls then plastered and incorporated into this newer structure. There's very little doubt that Peter's house was well known among early believers and held to be very special, probably because it was with Peter that Yeshua lived. 
in Capernaum. And so it was used as a small church that was later expanded into a bigger one. Now, during Yeshua's day, Capernaum was a medium-sized town of around 1,500 people or so. Obviously, it was a fishing village. It was built right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. But it also lay upon an important trade route. So the, time, uh, the town was a mix of Jews and non-Jews, mostly Romans. So now doubling back to the story of the Roman centurion we read about. He lived in Capernaum, which explains his presence there. The Romans always carefully guarded the all-important trade routes, so a garrison of soldiers stationed there would be logical. It would have been a very short walk from, Yesh, uh, from Jesus' encounter with the centurion to the centurion's house for Christ to heal his house slave. So even though the rules of Jewish tradition made the homes of Gentiles unclean, they lived side by side with the Jews. The Romans and the Jews encountered and worked with one another daily. And so the centurion would have been well schooled about Jewish attitudes and customs towards Gentiles. Now, as a history buff and a former archaeology major at university, it's always important to me to notice what kinds of materials were used for construction. Peter's house and the subsequent additions to it over the next couple of centuries were made of the local stone. That's usual. But that local so stone was called basalt. And basalt is volcanic in origin. In fact, <laughs> the volcano that spewed out the basalt and lava that came to be used for the construction of Capernaum is to be found at what is known today as the Golan Heights. That's essentially an extinct volcano. So the buildings and houses that time were very rough looking, although the hardness of basalt stone made those homes really sturdy. And it's allowed these structures to survive for centuries because they're, and they're going to survive for many more, but you know what their real enemy is? Earthquakes. So the first and most obvious clue that the present synagogue in Capernaum isn't the original one from Christ's time is that it was built using limestone, which had to come from some distance away. That's an expensive operation that a village of Jewish fishermen could never have contemplated. So although Christ was born in Bethlehem and he lived for many years with his parents in uh, Nazareth, during his days of ministry on earth, he lived most of the time in Capernaum. Now, Luke's version of this story puts several pieces of it together. So, we're going to conclude today with this story. This is Luke's version, starting in Luke 7 1. When Yeshua had finished speaking to the people, he went back to Capernaum, that's Capernaum, and a Roman army officer there had a servant that he regarded highly who was sick to the point of death. And hearing about Yeshua, the officer sent some Jewish elders to him with the request that he come and heal his servant. They came to Yeshua and pleaded earnestly with him, He really deserves you to have you do this, for he loves our people. In fact, he built the synagogue for us. Okay, not the limestone one, the basalt one that's under the limestone one. Okay. So Yeshua went with them. He had not gone far from the house when the officer sent friends who said to him, Sir, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. This is why I didn't presume to approach you myself. Instead, just give a command and let my servant recover. For I too am a man set under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, Go! He goes. To another, come, he comes. And to my slave, I say, do this, he does this. Yeshua was astonished at him. 
when he heard this. And he turned and he said to the crowd following him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such trust. When the messengers got back to the officer's house, they found the servant in good health. We'll continue in Matthew next week.